therapy. Uh, there's a lot of new and modern updates that are going on with the treatment. Um, hopefully some of the other residents will straggle in. Uh, this session is being recorded, so uh, we can view it as part of our teaching series in the future. So thank you all for coming. Dr. Goldman is a fourth year psychiatric resident, so we're, she's going to be leaving us. We're glad that she's been here for four years. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being on time. Um, thank you all for uh, your contributions to my education. Um, we've got a couple of special guests here. We've got Dr. Daniel Boyd, who is uh, the yeah. faculty site director for Lakeside for ECT, and I guess medical director of the ECT program at Lakeside. And um, is that right? Did I get that right? Okay, cool. And um, so thank you all. Um, so let's start. Um, how many of you feel like you understand uh, how ECT works and when it should be used and uh, what are some of the side effects and how dangerous it might be? Anybody feel like it might be kind of dangerous? Anybody think it might be a good idea? Have you done it on your pets? No? Okay. So first of all, I haven't yet figured out how to like, you know, get money out of the drug companies yet. But if any of the drug companies want to pay back my student loans, I can prescribe only your line of drugs. So that's my. Um, so by the end of this talk, I would like for you to be able to compare ECT with um, antidepressants um, and to see uh, how they might compare as far as effectiveness. Um, I want you to understand something about the historical context of ECT, and by understanding that, you may be a little more aware of why people might be frightened of it and why you don't need to be frightened. Um, I want to talk about some of the side effects that go with ECT or that can go with it and how these are dealt with. And I want you to know a little more about um, who we think would be a great um, candidate for ECT. So what are the major reasons why you might want to refer uh, one of your pets or one of your patients? Um, major depression is probably the biggest reason. Um, mania, although that's not as well uh, known in the United States, outside of the US, mania is much more commonly treated with ECT. Uh, schizophrenia with catatonia, schizoaffective disorders, catatonia, which can go with other things besides schizophrenia. It can go with depression. It can go with medical illnesses, um, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, and some other things. Uh, so within the United States, the FDA has six uh, cleared indications for use for ECT devices. So if it were a drug, it would be an on-label use. Severe depression, um, both in major depression and in bipolar, also mania. Again, that's not as commonly treated in the U.S., mostly probably because we have a whole lot of other drugs that work pretty fast. Uh, schizophrenia and catatonia. Um, and so in the United States, uh, we usually don't go to ECT as quickly as uh, we could because we like to make sure that um, patients have a horrible experience with lots of different drugs first before uh, we're ready to try the electricity. Um, and so outside of the U.S., ECT is um, used um, more commonly with schizophrenia than it is here. Um, so how effective is it? So let's compare with the STAR-D uh, findings. So that's a huge, big study um, that went on in the latter part of the last century and into the early part of this century. Seven years, on over 4,000 patients, more than 40 sites, lots of different uh, ethnic and um, age diversity, people with uh, major depression. Uh, they were not recruited from the newspaper. They were um, people that came into clinics looking for treatment. Um, and so they were uh, basically sorted into groups, and people were um, double-blinded, uh, controlled for lots of the medications that are typically used, including the SSRIs. Um, like the Prozac, and then the SNRIs, um, Effexor, then some of the other ones like mirtazapine, Buspar, um, tricyclics, 
the MAOI inhibitors. And about maybe half to two-thirds of them got a little something out of it. Um, and then a smaller number actually got to what we call remission, which is when you actually don't have depression anymore. Um, but most people would tend to sort of, like, drop out or stop taking the medications within a couple of years. And often it wasn't necessarily that they were feeling better, but they just sort of gave up. Maybe they felt better, maybe they didn't. But what we learned is that um, treatment-resistant depression requires more um, effort to treat than, like, easy-to-treat depression. And people who are going to get better with uh, one or two medication trials, they'll usually just get better. And then the people that don't get better in the first um, or second medication you try, you may have to go through a long list of medications before you can even get them out of what is called treatment-resistant depression. Um, and so ECT is often considered the last, um, last resort, and that's kind of too bad. Um, it would be kind of nice if people didn't have to have that much bad experience first. Uh, and so now if, if I tell you that ECT is the most effective biological treatment for depression that's currently available, it would be hard for me to cite which specific study is going to tell you that because there's pretty much almost a consensus. So at the very end of the talk, um, I'll have a list of resources, and you can look through there if you want to. Um, last night I came across an article from Brazil, and it's, um, it's pretty cool. Um, it has, like, meta-analyses from, like, the Latin American world. That's pretty neat. It, it echoes what's going on in, in this country as well. So how do we use ECT now? Um, so basically, it's kind of simple. It's sort of like Uncle Fester when he sticks his finger in a light socket and a light bulb goes on. Um, but basically, we, that's not true. We apply electricity carefully and safely to the scalp. We induce a controlled seizure uh, in the brain. We can see the person having um, some mild tremor, um, but not too much because we want to make it controlled. And then we watch and make sure the seizure stopped both in the body and the brain. And so it's the seizure itself that makes people get better. And there are many theories that exist, but we don't know exactly why people get better. We're trying to understand it, but we still haven't got it nailed down. But that hasn't stopped us from using medications and other treatments. Just because we don't know exactly why they work doesn't mean we don't use them. So the patient is always under general anesthesia. It's a very, a very short uh, muscle relaxant is used. And um, people don't um, flop all over the table or have to have four people hold them down <clears throat> anymore. And they, um, yeah, that happened in the past. It doesn't happen anymore. So how do we mitigate uh, side effects? Um, so anesthesia is really important. We use short acting, mostly um, at Lakeside uh, Brevital, which is methohexital, right? Yeah, OK. And Atomidate is what we usually use. Nobody would, we wouldn't dream of doing ECT without anesthesia and a muscle relaxant. Um, I learned in med school during an OB rotation, never use the word paralytic when you're talking to patients. Just say muscle relaxant. Um, and so everybody gets those things, and everybody's going to get oxygenated. Everybody's going to get a, a bite block so they don't break their teeth or bite their cheek. There's other things that they can have depending on the person and what they need. People with high blood pressure, they'll get a beta blocker like labetalol. Um, and then if they're going to have that, they'll need to have something to keep their um, uh, vagus nerve from bottoming out. So they'll need uh, some robinol, and that prevents um, the bradycardia. Also, some people like to smoke, and so we know that they produce a lot of secretions. So robinol is good for that. Um, we don't usually give Toradol in the very first treatment. We usually wait till the next treatment when they say, oh, I had such a headache. Then they get Toradol. Um, and if they say, oh, I was so nauseated, then they can have some Zofran. And uh, for people that just cannot give up their benzodiazepines before their ECT treatment, um, we can use flumazenil. Um, the way I can remember flumazenil is it rhymes with buzzkill. So it temporarily suspends the action of the um, GABA agonist. So the ECT experience. So people who receive ECT are generally satisfied and they have a better attitude about ECT than the patients who've never had it. So if you ask somebody, well, how do you feel about ECT? Well, I hate it. 
Well, have you had it? Well, no, but, you know, I heard about it. Okay. So this is from Dr. Ermita, and she's um, at Emory. And uh, when I attended her three-day, um, the three-day uh, training at Emory uh, last August. Um, so I'm kind of stealing this statistic from her presentation, but in, what she found was that 85% of the patients who did get ECT said that they would, if they need it, they'll go for another course of it. So uh, cognitive side effects are one of the main uh, reasons why people will think twice before they go ahead and do it. Um, and what we're finding is that there's ways to manage that and to minimize it. Um, in the past, a lot more electricity was used than what's used now. We use a smaller dose, and we use uh, what's called a, it's a square wave rather than a sine wave. And so there's lots of physics and math that goes into that. But basically, it's a smaller amount of electricity. It is um, like, I think it's under half of a millisecond, defines it as um, brief. And then ultra brief is if, if it's even smaller than that. But basically, you're only exposing them to the frequency and the amplitude um, of the electrical impulse that is the effective part, and then you're trimming off the other edges of the sine wave. That came into general use in the 70s. Also, you have um, the option of where you place the electrodes. So unilateral is considered more memory friendly. That's right unilateral. But bilateral is considered um, effective more quickly. So you have to weigh out what are your most important objectives. Um, so you want to plan for the individual patient. You want to assess them individually. You want to keep reassessing, monitoring them, and weighing the risks and benefits. So we're, it's almost like we're doing a new treatment plan each and every time we see them. But we just are deciding, are we going to keep going? Are we going to scale it back? Um, we don't do a cookie cutter approach. There's no one size fits all. And let's talk about the history, because this is pretty weird. Uh, so before people understood what is electricity, um, they figured out that it can help treat things like headaches. So in ancient Greece, Galen and his friends used to put a live fish on somebody's forehead to treat a headache, and uh, people used to stand on live eels. Um, it treated headaches, maybe, and some other things. So how did they explain electricity and treatment? Well, in the Middle Ages, before, uh, before we understood a lot of sciencey things, um, people thought it was spirits and special fluids and vibrations. In 1791, uh, Galvani demonstrated that electricity from machines can be used to stimulate nerves. And unfortunately, his nephew um, found some decapitated heads next to a guillotine just lying around on the ground, and he put electrodes, and he found he could induce facial movements. Uh, in 1864, in the Danish-Prussian War, Gustav Frisch uh, noticed accidentally irritating exposed brains of head-injured soldiers could result in twitching of the opposite side of the body. Um, and then in the 1860s, Frisch and Eduard Hitzig explored the cortex of dogs, finding the correct gentle dose of electricity by touching electrodes to their own tongues before touching the dog brain. In the early 1900s, Charles Sherrington continued mapping motor cortex details, he used anesthetized apes, monkeys, and he discovered the contiguous nature of the um, motor cortex. In the 1930s, Wilder Penfield explored human brains of living people who had intractable epilepsy as part of his surgery to excise lesioned brain foci. Um, he was more successful than previous surgeons uh, because he explored the brains of patients while they were awake and under local anesthesia. His goal was to find the specific damaged tissue, remove only that tissue while leaving the rest of the healthy brain tissue alone. In the early 20th century, discovery of brain regions, regions and predictable responses to stimulation allowed the mapping of the cortex um, by function, uh, for example, the Broca's areas, Broca areas, et cetera. Temporal lobe stimulation could produce memories of distant events from patients' lives. In 1937, an unexpected discovery, temporal lobe stimulation and memories um, Mr. Papez, I hope I say that right, 
discovered there is a stream of feeling or emotional circuitry, which McLean later defined as the visceral brain, which we now call the limbic system. In 1954, James Olds and Peter Milner at McGill were looking for the reticular formation. Uh, well, they found the reticular formation when they were looking for alertness and learning uh, center in rats. They accidentally discovered the pleasure center through bent wires that hit a slightly different part of the brain, and they noticed that the rats really seem to like that, and they would self-stimulate by pressing this button, and they would do it endlessly and even ignore their food um, as long as they could get that stimulation to the pleasure center. In the early 50s, there were efforts to build upon Olds and Milner's work, and at Tulane, Robert Heath worked with neurosurgeons to implant electrodes in psychiatric patients who had severe unremitting disorders. Uh, he made efforts to treat depression, pain, and what was considered at the time a disorder, which was homosexuality, through electrical stimulation of deep cortical structures, and he found the septal area, and these were not successful. And anybody who wants to read more about that, come and talk to me, and I'll show you what book I got it out of. There was a man named Jose Delgado, also um, of the 50s and at Yale. He experimented on um, animals to try to inhibit aggressive behavior using electric brain implants in cats, monkeys, rodents, and even humans. He stood in a ring with a charging bull. He pressed a button. The bull stopped suddenly a few feet away from him. But Delgado's work had uh, many troubling um, elements to it, and the fears were that technology was possibly going to be used for mind control by evil dictators. So these experiments fell out of favor. Um, in 1967, Graham Goddard attempted to treat epilepsy and uh, he noticed uh, an experimental artifact called kindling, which means the production of seizures in animals that could spread through the cortex um, by uh, spreading excitable waves. Um, and uh, unfortunately, some of the animals died, and so this placed even more of a damper on the research. And um, in 1950s, um, their ECT began to be supplanted by medications, including some fairly effective ones. Thorazine uh, came into use in 1954. Imipramine and Ipronizid in the 50s, and MAOIs and tricyclics came later. And then later on, we got um, the SSRIs. Um, and so more setbacks for ECT was uh, the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, if you've ever seen it. Um, you'd probably think, oh, you have to be out of your mind to get ECT. Um, but trust me, that's not what real ECT is. Um, L. Ron Hubbard from Scientology didn't do us any good at all. So there's a renewed interest in ECT uh, beginning in the 70s uh, when we figured out how to use shorter um, uh, duration um, exposure of electricity that's safer using the brief pulse instead of the sine wave. Um, and there were new, nearly universal measures to protect safety, um, like anesthesia and muscle relaxant. Um, I understand there may be nations in the world where ECT may be practiced without those things, but in the United States, that I cannot imagine that would happen. Um, so we had the STAR-D trial beginning in the 80s and going into the 2000s, which um, from that emerged a growing recognition that there are limits to how um, treatable depression is using pharmacology. So how does it work? We're not sure, but we think and we're pretty sure that some things that happen are that ECT does increase the uh, activity of the GABA in the cortical receptors, and it also enhances serotonergic function. Um, it works on the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, um, and it seems to help mitigate um, the toxic effects of stress, cortisol, and the neuronal structure and synaptic plasticity, um, in particular BDNF. Um, and there's a, one of the studies that I saw um, shows uh, it's a pathology of a mouse hippocampus, the, um, the cellular level um, of the, they're, they're like sort of the, germ cells in the hippocampus, they're actually getting thicker. It's pretty cool. So modern ECT, as we talked about earlier, general anesthesia, we titrate seizures, so we start 
at what we would estimate to be the person seizure threshold, and then we carefully titrate from there. If we want to go above the uh, minimum amount of electricity that will cause them to have a seizure that we can observe, and we want to go far enough above it that they're getting um, an effective dose. Um, for the muscle relaxant, a depolarizing agent is used, and again, placement of electrodes can be right unilateral, it can be bifrontal. At Emory, they're doing bitemporal. Um, and the seizure itself, we want it to last at least 20 seconds, and but we don't want it to go longer than two minutes. So if we think that it's going on longer, we'll, we'll put a stop to it with um, medication. So what to expect? Uh, so after the treatment, um, there's a recovery procedure, and um, there are a few side effects. Um, so within minutes to hours, um, they'll come out of what seems like a temporary amnesia or post-ictal confusion. They'll commonly report headaches or muscle aches or nausea, and we have medication for that. And over time, these things get better. Um, people don't like going without food or coffee, and so you have to prepare them for that. Um, so they're sometimes a little grumpy. Um, and they sometimes people get anxious about needles. Um, it's, it's funny, a woman just the other day um, said she was waking up after her procedure, and she goes, so I've decided I don't want my procedure after all. It's like, well, honey, you just had it. Um, we ask our patients not to drive themselves to the clinic, and we want them to have somebody who will drive them home and just sort of be around for them over the next 24 hours. Um, and on average, maybe eight, 12 treatments will see like noticeable improvement. Some people will get better before six. Some people it takes more. Um, so they, people don't get better right away. It's sort of a delayed effect. Um, acute course, so if you're trying to pull somebody back from the brink of death, maybe an acute course would be two to four weeks. An average, uh, six or 12 weeks. Um, for example, right unilateral, maybe three uh, treatments per week. Um, Bifrontal, maybe twice a week. Um, this is an Emory thing, the bifrontal. Um, it can be done inpatient or outpatient, and m many of our patients um, benefit from maintenance ECT. There's no two people alike, so we have to keep reevaluating. Uh, choose your electrode placement. Um, so for depression, try right unilateral first. For catatonia, you don't have time to waste. If the patient is not eating, um, if they're suicidal, if they're so depressed, uh, you don't have time to sit around and wait, then you need to get going with um, bilateral. Um, and in bipolar disorder, Emory is saying bifrontal or bitemporal is a good idea. Um, and placement varies somewhat by center. Um, but the trend you know, that we're seeing is that lower doses um, is more friendly to the um, prevent cognitive side effects. Um, what, we're, what we're aiming for is the most benefit with the least side effects. So unilateral and bilateral are the most common placements used. Um, so in your workup, so you want to carefully identify um, uh, pre-existing medical conditions that people have, know about them. There's no absolute contraindications, but you don't want to have an unpleasant surprise of treating somebody only to discover that they have a cardiac history they didn't tell you about or a breathing problem they didn't tell you about. You want to know what is their baseline cognition. You want to know what medications they have not tried um, because you're also documenting for um, insurance. You know, this isn't the first thing they've ever tried. You need to have an EKG. Um, I don't think we always have to have a CT scan, but if somebody's maybe a little bit over 50 or they have any history of passing out, it's probably a good idea. You want to make sure that their um, labs are okay. You want to know about their allergies, if they have airway problems, um, if they need a dental uh, visit. And you also want to clearly define who's in charge of picking them up, keeping an eye on them, who is filling their prescriptions um, in between sessions or as soon as they're finished. Um, depression is terrible. It's it really, it kills people. Um, so e ECT is the most effective treatment in more than 80% of patients with treatment-resistant resistant depression, and it's more effective than antidepressant medication. How about using it as a first-line therapy? Maybe, if you're dealing with a patient who's profoundly ill, who's actively suicidal, 
refusing to eat or drink. Um, it is a something to consider. Mania, why would it work on mania? It might uh, work because it would raise the seizure threshold, acting like the same as an anticonvulsant. Um, it is effective for the treatment of mania. We're not giving this to children, but it has been shown to help with intractable mania and also patients with dementia who have comorbid mania. Uh, schizophrenia is one of the indications. Um, People who have schizophrenia that is the affective, that have an affective component, are more likely to respond to ECT. And it is um, a good idea to consider ECT for people who are young who are having their first psychotic break. Can ECT be used for Parkinson's? It's not generally used for Parkinson's, but it can be. Um, it can help uh, for the treatment of motor and mo mood symptoms, even in the absence of psychiatric disorders. Um, what are predictors of a favorable response? Um, ironically, advanced age predicts a better response. People who have severe disability and who have painful uh, movement disorders can benefit from ECT. It doesn't work forever, but then, you know, carbidopa, levodopa works for, you know, minutes to hours. ECT might help for days to maybe a couple weeks. Um, are there absolute contraindications? Not really. There's mostly relative contraindications. A person who's had a recent heart attack or they just had a stroke, it might be hard to find an anesthesiologist willing to treat them. But, you know, if you could find one, then they could probably be treated. Um, so illnesses that increase intracranial pressure. Um, Dr. Boyd found an article on a person, uh, I think it was a case study of a person with um, idiopathic intracranial pressure. Um, normal pressure hydrocephalus, and I think that they found that they could treat that with ECT. Um, you certainly want to know about it. You don't want to just treat it without knowing what you're dealing with. Um, so an aneurysm or a vascular malformation might be, you, you need to be very, very careful with that. Uh, it's the anesthesiologists who mostly are going to be the ones who could exclude somebody uh, from treatment because they don't meet uh, the anesthesiologist's criteria for how comfortable the, um, they're going to be. Severe pulmonary disease, um, be careful with the airway. LMAs are used for people. We know some people who like to smoke or who have kind of um, a certain type of body habitus or they already have obstructive sleep apnea. They're going to need an LMA every time. Um, how about if somebody has a metal plate in their head or their teeth are crumbling and falling out or they're a left-handed person, or they have piercings, or they have a pacemaker. Well, we can work with that. What are clinical um, response indicators? Um, who is going to get better, faster with ECT? Ironically, it's the people you would least expect. Um, the older the patient, um, the uh, more likely they are to respond favorably. Psychosis, um, catatonia. Um, these people have uh, diminished function uh, so, so bad that ECT is going to help them uh, recuperate quickly. Um, people that are already getting better by the third session will likely be um, doing real well after a few more sessions. Uh, how do we measure response? Is there a biological marker for that? At Emory, they found that post-ictal suppression is the most consistent biological marker for ECT response. Um, and we can see it on an EEG tracing. Um, we look for the little downward inflection. Uh, so we, we have to look for not only did they have a seizure, but also did the seizure stop. What are negative predictors? Uh, folks who have treatment-resistant depression, who have tried multiple medications, not only are they less likely to get better fast with uh, medication, but they're also less likely to get better fast with ECT, they might need uh, longer treatments. Maybe, maybe it won't work. Probably it'll help a little bit. People with personality disorders, sometimes almost nothing makes these folks better. Um, people that have been depressed longer, it may take longer to get them out of depression. Uh, people that have little specks of something, some schmutz or something on their MRI in their, around their uh, ventricles, their, their brain already has some kind of intracellular crap building up in there. 
And people who like to use a lot of substances, are, they're just harder to treat. What about medications? Well, first of all, the patient should not have eaten or had anything to drink since midnight. Um, should they take their heart medicines? Yes, they should, except not lidocaine and not theophylline. Um, glaucoma medications could interact with um, the succinylcholine. Um, if they have diabetes and they're NPO, you probably don't want to give them anything that will bring their blood sugar down further. Um, are they on antipsychotics or antidepressants? You can continue those. Lithium, you might want to hold off. I think it's about protecting kidneys. I think there's going to be a little bit of rhabdo, so you kind of want to give the kidneys a break. Um, anticonvulsants, they can sort of get in the way of giving somebody a convulsion. So you want to taper those down if you can. Um, what about the person that just cannot give up their clonazepam? They're like, oh, no, I'm not getting in the car. I'm not going to the clinic. Oh, no, oh, no. They have to have their clonazepam. Okay, fine. So they can have just a little flumazenil, and then they can have their treatment, and then they can have their clonazepam. Anesthesia, Brevital, it's short-acting. Propofol, it shortens the length of the seizures, um, but it also kind of helps people who have trouble with when they're waking up, they're kind of in a really, really bad place. Atomidate can increase the seizure duration. So we'll switch sometimes from Brevital to Atomidate when we're not getting a seizure that's long enough to meet our satisfaction. Um, so sexinylcholine is a muscle relaxant. Um, if a person has a neuromuscular disorder and they have a pseudocholinesterase deficiency, we would look for a different agent. Um, and these medications are always uh, given by the anesthesiologists. Um, no ECT is ever going to happen without an anesthesiologist around, so make sure that you stay friends with them. Um, so there's things to keep you from um, going into a systole. There's things to keep you from having lots of sloppy, spitty secretions. Um, if you're going to give an anticholinergic, you have to... Um, I'm sorry, if you're going to give a beta blocker, then you have to give an anticholinergic. You don't want to have um, hypertension, um, and you don't want to have an increased heart rate. So you have to keep an eye on all those things. Um, so what happens after the patient has had 6 or 12 treatments? Well, we're asking them every time, how are you? Did you notice any side effects? How's your mood? How's your sleep? What do your family members think? Um, how's your memory? Um, so each patient is different, and we're going to have to um, treat each person differently. Um, more and more, it's looking like uh, maintenance ECT is pretty much the way to go. So instead of just getting all your treatments in the hospital, boom, you're done, back to the world, uh, you know, good luck, uh, we're actually tapering people off more. And um, at Emory, they're actually recommending now their, um, what medications you might want to try if they haven't tried already after ECT is they're actually doing lithium and um, Elevil or nortriptyline if they haven't ever used that combination before. Complications and side effects include post-ictal agitation and delirium. This is a fairly, not extremely uncommon, um, but it's something to really be aware of, and it is manageable. Cardiovascular side effects, including arrhythmias, cognitive side effects, headaches, muscle aches, nausea. We talked about this some already. Again, know the medical history, know the uh, pre-existing conditions. Um, you can predict um, transient ischemic hypertension in some people, and for that, atropine glycopyrrolate are going to be used to prevent uh, bradycardia if you have to use labetalol. You always have your O2 mask. You always have your bag valve. Everybody gets that. Some people get the airways. Okay, so what about their um, fake teeth and their, the plate in their head? Um, so we always try to protect people. Um, we don't want them to bite themselves or their teeth to break. If they have terrible bad teeth, we suggest that they see a dentist and maybe get the teeth pulled or fixed before their treatment. Take your dentures out, please. Um, you can actually do ECT on a, a person who's had a crown because the um, electricity is, um, the current is not going to that part of their skull. If the person had a metal plate in their head, you would try to treat the other side. 
If they have eyebrow piercings, please tell your patient to take the piercings out. Delirium. So delirium is always a risk in general of any patient in, who has already got a low reserve capacity of their brain. If they have pre-existing conditions, um, be aware of, like in Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or um, cardiovascular risk factors or structural changes to the caudate nucleus. Um, so this is why uh, medical history is needed and in some cases CT head is needed before we do ECT. Um, we know, this is why we need to know about their labs. We need recent labs. Um, and if the person is having trouble coming out of their um, anesthesia um, uh, state, uh, we need to know that, and we need to be able to reverse that if, if necessary. Post-ictal agitation. So th it's different from very transitory post-ictal confusion. So it's normal for a person having a seizure, even not an ECT seizure, but like an epilepsy seizure, to feel kind of confused and dazed um, right afterwards. Um, so we're going to uh, educate our patients and their families beforehand so they won't be shocked um, I don't mean it literally, but so that they won't be surprised when they've had, it's like, oh, why, you know, why is uh, Uncle Jeb so confused? Well, you know, he had a seizure. That's why he's not going to be driving home. So you're going to offer him reassurance. You're going to give him some food, um, some water to drink some juice. Post-ictal agitation is not the same as routine post-ictal confusion. It's similar in that it's, it's a transitory delirium. It requires careful management. Um, you want to differentiate it from the seizure itself or from status epilepticus, and that's why you're carefully monitoring and, and you have your eye on the EEG during the procedure. Not only do you want to be sure they have a seizure, but you want to know for sure that the seizure stopped. It can be difficult to predict, and some patients who get postictal agitation are the same ones who are likely to get it again. So you really want to know your patients, try to prevent the next episode. Uh, you might consider increasing the succinylcholine next time uh, with less uh, muscle activity. They'll be producing less serum lactate, and so they'll be less likely to have kind of an acidotic state. Um, you might use a small dose of uh, Brevitol um, after um, next time that they're treated. And um, if they've ripped out their IV, well, you're going to get some very strong but also very gentle, um, big uh, staff to hold them down while the nurse is getting the IM out of end. Um, so you want to recognize that the patient could be in sort of a baby-like state. Maybe they're a sweet baby. Maybe they're angry baby. But you're going to talk with them gently and nicely and reassuringly, even if, if it takes five big dudes or maybe you know, several big dudes and maybe a few small ones and some females, but until you get the I am shot there for them. Um, I love these pictures. This, I think, is from Egypt. So the cognitive side effects. We manage these with electrode placement. Uh, we determine the intensity of the stimulus, the frequency of the sessions. Memory loss can be anterograde. Like, I forgot what happened to me, you know, right after I had ECT, did I have a cheese sandwich or a fish sandwich? Or, hey, I forgot the drive over here, or maybe even, hey, I forgot what happened two weeks ago. Um, over time, most of that memory gets recovered. Um, in the past, when larger doses of electricity were being used, uh, people had uh, more difficulty with memory. Um, we're very careful to keep monitoring that. Um, oh, I would say one more thing about that is if you're planning on spending lots of money on an expensive vacation, like to Paris, don't do it just the month before you do treatment because, like, all you're going to have is the photos. So save that money, get your ECT, then your mood's better, then you can go to Paris. Um, so weigh your risks and benefits. Um, bilateral ECT is considered kind of, it works quicker, it has more side effects. Right-sided, right unilateral, it tends to um, require more treatments to get well, but it tends to cause less memory issues. Ultra-brief is a shorter waveform, and it is a more targeted dose. There's less electricity exposure. It might take a little longer to get better, um, but you generally will see the patient get better 
keep reassessing, and always remember that the risk of not treating severe depression includes suicide. So death is a known risk for depression. You always want to weigh your risks and benefits both of treatment and of non-treatment. Um, so headache, um, for that, there's a whole bunch of over-the-counters. There's Toradol. For nausea, there's Phenergan. For muscle aches and stiffness, generally we'll tell folks that you may experience uh, feelings of muscle stiffness and some muscle aches uh, after your first and second treatment, almost like you'd been going to work out in the gym, um, because you have. Those are muscles you weren't using for a long time. Now you are. So usually the third, fourth, and fifth treatment, they don't have uh, so much of that. Uh, fatigue and mild confusion. Again, you tell them about it. They're not going to be driving. Their family members know. Don't sign any big contracts. Um, don't get married. Don't get divorced right after ECT. So now that you were here and you listened carefully and paid attention, you can compare the effectiveness of ECT versus um, antidepressant medication to treat depression. And you'll understand something about the historical context of ECT. You'll understand why it's probably um, nowhere near as dangerous as L. Ron Hubbard seems to think it is. And you'll understand that there are some predictable side effects that can go along with ECT, but um, that there's also ways to manage those. And you'll also even be able to identify some factors in which patients um, make really good candidates for ECT. So in summary, the more ECT is studied, the more evidence um, is surfacing that supports ECT as superior in efficacy to standard medical treatments like drugs. Um, and as measured by the known rates of remission um, in, um, that is observed and understood by the STAR-D trial. Um, ECT is practiced in the United States by standards that are um, overwhelmingly safe, and it is well tolerated and effective. There are side effects and decisions about um, how to manage those using medications um, have to be taken into consideration. And uh, currently, um, ECT is mainly used to treat um, depression, both bipolar and unipolar. It's also used to treat catatonia. It's I believe, extremely underutilized for the treatment of all of the above. Um, the predictable but manageable side effects that can occur can be mitigated, um, and there's a lot of ways to adjust for that, and there's a lot of misinformation, but it's very important to counter this with uh, scientific evidence. Um, and for me, one of the most rewarding um, and motivating reasons why I enjoy um, having the opportunity to help provide ECT to patients is uh, seeing people get better. Now, will they all get better? No, but a lot of them will get a lot better. Um, and you just kind of like see people sort of like hatching out of their shell, and that's really cool. There's a lot of articles on it. This is just a tiny pinch of the number of articles that are out there. There's resources for families if you're interested. Thank you so much for supporting my efforts. Thank you especially to the staff at Lakeside to Dr. Boyd, Dr. Harris, Dr. DeCunha, um, the kind of most cheerful of all the anesthesiologists, Dr. Doro, to our extremely competent um, nurse goddess, Deva Shaw, uh, and to our awesome uh, staff, Robert, James, and Randy. Um, there's no way we could do this without you guys. Um, at, at Emory, I really enjoyed um, the teaching from Dr. Adriana Ermida, and um, thank you, Dr. Hill and Dr. Bell and Leanne, wherever you are. Um, thank you so much. And also to Dr. GK in Tucson, who's apparently going to let me um, shock some of his patients when I graduate. So thanks, everyone. OK, so now it's time for the chopped liver, the bagels, and cream cheese. Any questions? OK, I saw the first hand over here. Um, it's actually uh, Dr. Brooks. Oh, that's a big problem. So if they are not, um, if they don't have capacity to consent, 
then we have to look for um, you know, a family member if we can get it. And if they don't have any family, then we're really in big trouble. But um, sometimes over at, for example, MMHI, um, they can go through a process where they can be uh, legally, it, it, it is really, really difficult. You know, in other words, if the patient won't consent and the family won't consent, I, I don't, I mean, in theory, if you had a way to get the state to declare somebody blah, 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 yeah, but in practice, not here, not in Memphis. I'm not aware of any. And Dr. Quinn, I think you had a question. Yeah, I was going to encourage you to research about those for PTSD. Yes, yes. Um, I just saw something the other day. I wish I had saved it. The answer is yes. Yes, definitely. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Anybody else? Uh, Dr. Billbrook. Oh, yeah. Okay, so thanks for asking. Okay, so that what we've figured out is that in people who have, who are righties, okay, um, mostly their speech center is still where you would expect it to be on the left side. Um, and we could be wrong, but we're generally going to do right unilateral even for the right-handed person. Um, but then, again, we'll have to, you know, reassess if, if this is not a a good choice. We'll we'll take a look at that. Um, I've never heard of that, but I honestly, I mean, anything's possible. Ah, Dr. Baltz is nodding her head. There you go. You can get a transient aphasia if you hit the speech center. And Dr. Hill says just like it causes, it can cause paralysis. Temporarily, Do, just like a Todd's paralysis, which is a transient, a, it's going to go away. It's going to resolve. I saw another hand. Um, the youngsters in the back. Oh, Dr. Hill. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to repeat the question Dr. Hill asked and that Dr. Boyd answered. The question is, um, so after you finish your residency, can you go and work um, doing ECT in the hospital? And the answer is yes and no. Depends on each hospital. Um, I would agree with Dr. Boyd. Um, sometimes maybe it seems like hospitals might not have high enough standards or criteria. Um, at Lakeside, the standard is you have to be certified by ISIN, which is International Society for Electroconvulsive or electrostimulation, ECT and neurostimulation, yes. Um, and so this year, and they always meet just before the APA conference, so this year APA conference is in San Diego, it's in May, uh, and so that's a one-day um, training, and th then you take their test and you pass. Um, there are, like Dr. Boyd said, three uh, centers of excellence. It's Columbia, it's Duke, and Emory, where you can go for a short like three day to seven day uh, program. And um, I actually believe that probably the most helpful training that I've gotten has been, has it been three months of experience, just hands on and just learning, you know, tr you know treating, assisting with procedures over at Lakeside. So 
Um, I'm really looking forward to getting certified. Um, in my future job, my understanding is that the requirement is um, not, it doesn't require certification. Um, but I'm really, I'm pleased that I'm going to have that. I think it's, I think it's helpful. Dr. Iyer. Yes, unfortunately there is. I think it's like about $1,200 for the course. Then your cost of gas, and if you want to pay for a hotel or Airbnb, or if you have relatives in Atlanta. So if you do the workshop, do you get that certificate already? Mm, not the one at Emory, no. But um, Emory gives you their own little thing, but it's not an ISIN certification. I actually think the Emory training is more intensive and you'll learn more because it's several days, you know, whereas ISIN, it's only going to be one day. Um, so there's not really a correlation between um, being certified and knowing more, but it just, it's like a brownie point that you have. Any other questions? You guys have been, have been awesome, and um, unfortunately, we don't have the chopped liver and the uh, bagels, do, but once the federal budget passes, I'm sure we'll have that. So if you just wait another five minutes, we should have the food pretty soon. Thanks, everyone.